Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2023. Lesson 11 is titled Mission to the Unreached Part 2 and is ready for teaching on December 16. Your reader this week is Dr. Percy Harold. This is the Sabbath School lesson. The series is titled God's Mission, Our Mission. Sabbath afternoon, December 15. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we open your word this week, once again we ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us. May your words speak to us and encourage us and guide us and lead us in the way that you would have us go. As we study this week more about reaching those who do not know you, we pray that the people around us may come to know you because of our witness. But as we open your word, we ask for your blessing. We ask for your blessing on ourselves, our families, our churches, our communities. And today I'd particularly like to pray for Sophie Kerr, for Susanna Lake, for Rima Woods, for Dolores Ocampo and for Audrey Walker. Lord, these people need your help as each of us needs your help. And I pray that you will be with us, be with them. And to anyone who's listening, Lord, I just ask for your blessing in their life today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew chapter 15 and verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Let's read that again, Matthew 15, 28. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. From the beginning, a loving God sought his lost children. We read that in Revelation 3 verse 9. And to our day, this same loving God is still seeking to reach the lost, as we will see in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, including the lost in the cities. And our two texts, Genesis 3 verse 9, reads, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? God seeking us. And then Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends for ever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In 2018, the United Nations published its latest findings which show that 55% of the planet's population live in urban areas, and this will grow, if time should last, to 68% in 2050. We have no choice. We must witness to those in the cities. Yet, many of God's people act as Jonah did when called to witness to a city. For whatever reason, they flee from the task. Romans 15 verse 4 reads, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. That includes what was written about Jonah. 
When here, Jesus ministered not only to those in the cities of Israel, but to those in foreign regions as well. That is, to those outside of the Jewish nation and the chosen people. This week, we will study the Bible story of Christ's mission to Tyre and Sidon and draw lessons to apply to our lives today. Sunday, December 10, Mission to Regions Beyond. We read that Jesus took his disciples from Gennesaret, Matthew 14, 34, and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon in Matthew 15, 21. Let's look at those texts. Matthew 14 and verse 34, when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. And then in Matthew 15, verse 21, then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Why did he take them from Galilee to these pagan places? He leads his disciples on this field trip into the borders of these foreign regions so that they can learn on location what they could not learn so easily in Galilee. He wanted to teach his disciples lessons that would help prepare them for their calling to reach all people groups, including urbanites. Read Judges 3 verses 1 to 6 and 1 Kings 5 1 to 12 and 1 Kings 11 verse 16. How do these texts help us understand a bit of the background of these cities? First of all, Judges 3 1 to 6. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left, that he might test Israel by them. That is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formally known it. Namely, five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians and the Hivites who dwelt in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hermon to the entrance of Hamath. And they were left that he might test Israel by them, to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Thus, the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. From Judges 3, 1 to 6, we see that these ancient peoples were used by God to test the Israelites' faith. Unfortunately, God's people failed that test too, at least in this instance. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods, in verse 6. Thus, right from the start, these people were a stumbling block to Israel. And then in First Kings 5, 1 to 12, Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon because he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father. For Hiram had always loved David. Then Solomon said to Hiram, saying, You know how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the wars which were fought against him on every side until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet? But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. And behold, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne, in your place, he shall build the house for my name. Now therefore, command that they cut down cedars for me from Lebanon, and my servants will be your servants, and I will pay you wages for your servants according to whatever you say. For you know there is none among us who has skill to cut timber like the Sidonians. So it was, when Hiram heard the words of Solomon, that he rejoiced greatly. 
and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, for he has given David a wise son over this great people. Then Hiram said to Solomon, saying, I have considered the message which you sent me, and I will do all you desire concerning the cedar and cypress logs. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon to the sea. I will float them in rafts by sea to the place you indicate to me, and will have them broken apart there. Then you can take them away, and you shall fulfill my desire by giving food for my household. Then Hiram gave Solomon cedar and cypress logs according to all his desire. And Solomon gave Hiram twenty thousand cores of wheat as food for his household, and twenty cores of pressed oil. Thus Solomon gave to Hiram year by year. So the Lord gave Solomon wisdom, as he had promised him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty together. In First Kings 5, verses 1 to 11, we can see the close relationship between the Sidonians and the Hebrews. Though on one level the economic ties were mutually beneficial, no doubt the Hebrews were still negatively influenced by the paganism and idolatry of their trading partners. And then 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. And that reads, But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. And he had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not follow fully the Lord as did his father David. First Kings 11, 1 to 6 reveals just how negative that influence eventually became. King Solomon married Sidonian princesses who led him astray, for Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, we read in verse 5. Yet, despite the history of paganism and idolatry and their negative influence on the chosen nation, Jesus still brought his disciples to these places. In this way, he initiated them in cross-cultural urban mission, confronting their bias and bigotry, and modelled for his followers holistic urban mission to all cultures and nationalities. Many challenges face the Adventist urban missionary. Among them include health and environmental concerns. Others would include the high cost of living, racism, bigotry, nationalism, and constraints on religious freedom and expression. Nevertheless, despite these obstacles, we must work for the cities. And so to finish today, what can you do to help those involved in urban ministry? Monday, December 11, Seeking the Multitudes Despite challenges, external and internal, Jesus graciously extends the call to us for his mission to the cities. Read Matthew nine thirty-five to 38 What does this teach us about mission to the multitudes wherever we find them? Matthew 9, beginning at verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. 
Jesus was moved with compassion for the multitudes, such as are found in the cities. Luke 19 verse 41 describes how Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. We may not understand the depths of Jesus' love for his children, even for the faceless masses living in the cities. This is why, in Matthew 9.38, Jesus tells us to pray so that our motives and hearts can be like his. Read Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 to 25. As Jesus began his ministry, from what geographic locations did the people come? Matthew 4, beginning at verse 23, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan." In Matthew 4.25, the multitudes following Jesus came from Galilee, from the ten city-states of the Decapolis in the east, from Jerusalem and from Judea to the south. Besides Samaria, what region was missing? The coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, part of Phoenicia along the Mediterranean Sea and northwest of Galilee. We now see why Jesus went to this area. This trip to the region of Tyre and Sidon was one of Jesus' cross-cultural mission trips. After the encounter with the Pharisees, Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 399, Jesus withdrew from Capernaum and crossed Galilee, repaired to the hill country on the borders of Phoenicia. Looking westward, he could see, spread out upon the plain below, the ancient cities of Tyre and Sidon, with their heathen temples, their magnificent palaces and marts of trade, and the harbours filled with shipping. End of quote. And so to finish today, how can we help people see just how futile, in and of themselves, their magnificent palaces and marts of trade are, and why they need Jesus. Tuesday, December 12, in Tyre and Sidon. Bible scholars believe that the Gospel of Matthew had been written specifically for a Jewish audience and that Mark was written with primarily a Gentile audience in mind. It is helpful to keep this distinction before us as we study the Gospels. Read Matthew 15, verses 22 to 28, and Mark 7, verses 24 to 30. What differences do you see in how the woman was depicted? Matthew 15, verse 22, And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith, let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. And then in Mark chapter 7, we begin at verse 24. From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered the house and wanted no one to know it. But he could not be hidden, for a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. 
But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For this saying, Go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out, and her daughter lying on the bed. Notice how Matthew describes this mother using her nationality or race, Canaanite. Mark is led by the Holy Spirit to use additional terms to describe this mother as a Greek or a Gentile, and then gives additional information, a Syrophoenician by birth or a Syrian of Phoenicia, the only time this term is used in the Bible. Consider how this story in Matthew 15 would impact the intended primary audience with their background and worldview. Matthew's audience would see his mother as a despised heathen. This comes from the Jewish people's historical experience with the Canaanites as an idol-worshipping people group whose evil lifestyles and practices had long been a stumbling block to their nation. Even Christ's disciples did not consider the possibility that this woman had faith and was part of the kingdom of God. In Mark 7, Mark's audience of Gentiles would have a different response from that of Matthew's. The Gentiles did not have the same experience as the Jews did with the Canaanites. Instead, the Gentiles would identify with this woman, a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth. Jesus healed one of their own. For the Gentiles, this woman would be regarded as a beloved mother who was concerned about the fate of her daughter and wanted the Master to heal her, regardless of this mother's ethnic and national background. Christ did not immediately reply to the woman's request, Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 400. He received this representative of a despised race as the Jews would have done. In this, he designed that his disciples should be impressed with the cold and heartless manner in which the Jews would treat such a case, as evinced by his reception of the woman and the compassionate manner in which he would have them deal with such distress, as manifested by his subsequent granting of her petition. End of quote. And so to finish the day, read 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. What should this text tell us about how we are all the same before God? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Wednesday, December 13, Send Her Away In the unreached neighbourhood of the cities, there are many who long for hope. During Christ's time, what prevented God's people from bringing hope of the Messiah to such foreign cities as Tyre and Sidon? Nationalism, pride and prejudice blinded God's people to the opportunities to see those nearest to them who longed for the hope foretold by the prophecies of the first advent. Today, in the cities, there are many population groups with whom Jesus Christ wants his people to share the blessed hope of the second advent, as we read in Titus Chapter 2, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And just as Christ didn't care what their nationality or race was, neither should we. Read Acts chapter 10, verses 9 to 16, verse 28, and verses 34 and 35. How would you summarize the lesson taught here by the Holy Spirit? Acts 10, beginning at verse 9, The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray, about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet, bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. 
In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. And then verse 28, Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation? But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And then verses 34 and 35, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. While waiting for lunch, Peter was given a vision of a rooftop buffet complete with a tablecloth filled with unclean animals and birds. Three times he was told in his vision to get up and eat. God used these visions to confront Peter's religious pride and bigotry against the Gentiles. Peter eventually understood this truth. Then Peter, it says in Acts 10, 34 and 35, opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. With this background, let's reflect on our story for lessons from Tyre and Sidon. Look again at Jesus and his interaction with the mother. What lessons did the disciples learn from this field trip that related also to Peter's vision? How can we apply these to our lives today and to Christ's last day call to his mission to the cities? What biases prevent us from seeing the needs of urbanites? What opportunities has God provided to us in the cities to expand our mission understanding and caringly to confront our bigotry, nationalism and spiritual pride? Jesus patiently taught his disciples, who did not yet fully understand that God's great plan of salvation was for the entire human family, not just one nation or rural ethnic group. The Holy Spirit can help us to overcome our prejudice and bias in order to complete our mission to the cities. And so to finish today, read Galatians 2 verses 11 to 13. What should this teach us about how hard it can be to be purged of the prejudices we've been taught since childhood? Let's read Galatians 2, beginning at verse 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Thursday, December 14. Faith on Earth? In Luke chapter 18, verse 8, Jesus asked this question at the end of one of his parables. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? As Christ's disciples today, we need to see what Jesus is looking for. In this story, we can see that Jesus is looking for faith that shines even amid darkness. Read Matthew 8. 10 and 13, Matthew 9, 2, Matthew 20, verses 29 to 34, Mark 2, verse 5, Mark 10, verse 46 to 52, and Luke 18, verses 35 to 43. In these passages, whom does Jesus describe as having faith? 
Firstly, Matthew 8, beginning at verse 10. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. And Matthew 9, verse 2, Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And Mark chapter 2 and verse 5, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Matthew 20 verses 29 to 34, Now, as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road, when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, Son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. And Mark 10, verse 46 to 52, Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. And Luke 18, verses 35 to 43. Then it happened, as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the road begging, and hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by, and he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him, and when he had come near, he asked him, saying, saying, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. This list includes people with faith that shone even in dark cities. In Capernaum, Jesus highlights several people with faith. In Matthew 8, verses 10 and 13, we see a converted pagan centurion with great faith. Matthew 8, verse 10, When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And verse 13, Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. We meet four faith-filled friends who ripped up the roof to bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus in Matthew 9, verse 2, and Mark 2, verse 5. In Matthew we read, Then behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And Mark records it, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. 
In Mark 10, we meet the former blind man Bartimaeus, whose faith shines bright in Jericho. At the same time, we would expect that among God's people, there would be great faith. Yet, even in Jesus' hometown of Nazareth, little faith, or even outright unbelief, was the limiting factor to Christ's ministry. Among his disciples, several times Jesus says of Israel, O thou of little faith. Matthew 6 verse 30. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And Matthew eight twenty six. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And Matthew 14, verse 31, And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And Matthew 16, verse 8, But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, O you of little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? And in Matthew seventeen seventeen, Jesus exclaims, O faithless and perverse generation. One lesson that we can apply today is that faith is found in unexpected places, in the cities among foreigners, pagans and people with different religions. In humility, we must go into the cities as Jesus did, seeking out those who, when presented with truth, will respond with a saving faith in Jesus, and they are indeed out there. And that brings us to challenge. Open your heart in prayer for a greater portion of faith with which to share your love for those near and far. And challenge up. How did you come to know Jesus and the precious three angels' messages? List three spiritual blessings that you have experienced from Jesus in your personal life. Prepare to share these concepts with your Sabbath school class. Friday, December 15. Among those whom the Jews styled heathen were men who had a better understanding of the scripture prophecies concerning the Messiah than had the teachers in Israel, writes Ellen White in the Desire of Ages, page 33. There were some who hoped for his coming as a deliverer from sin. Philosophers endeavoured to study into the mystery of the Hebrew economy, but the bigotry of the Jews hindered the spread of the light. End of quote. And then from the same writer from the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald of January 17, 1893, comes this gem. The Lord Jesus, the mighty Saviour, has died for these souls. He can arouse them from their indifference. He can awaken their sympathies. He can soften their hearts. He can reveal to their souls the beauty and power of the truth. The master worker is God and not finite man. And yet he calls upon men to be the agents through whom he can impart light to those in darkness. God has jewels in all the churches, and it's not for us to make sweeping denunciation of the professed religious world, but in humility and love present to all the truth as it is in Jesus. Let men see piety and devotion. Let them behold Christ-likeness of character, and they will be drawn to the truth. They are to lift up Jesus, the world's Redeemer. They are to hold forth the words of life. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, what are some of the immediate needs in the areas where you live that could give you and your church the opportunity to reach out to souls who don't know the truths that we do? Two, look at Ellen G. White's words above regarding those of other faiths. God has jewels in all the churches, and it is not for us to make sweeping denunciation of the professed religious world. In other words, how can we show people the error of their ways, while at the same time not denigrating the people personally? And three, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? We read in Luke 18, verse 8. 
What does Jesus mean by this rhetorical question? What is the difference between faith and belief? Why might people who have the correct belief be found void of faith when Christ returns? Dreaming Dreams Part 1 by Andrew McChesney 16-year-old Joseph Delamu was anxious. He worried that he wasn't attending the right church in Konaki, capital of the West African country of Guinea. Show me the way, he prayed. I'll go wherever you lead. That night he had a vivid dream. He dreamed that he and 70 members of his church were on a compound making plans on how to grow their congregation. Outside the compound loomed the palace of a mighty king, the ruler of the world. Abruptly, a unit of soldiers burst into the compound. You need to leave, a soldier told Joseph. We want to train you to join our ranks. Joseph didn't want to leave, but the soldier insisted. You can't stay, he said. Leave. Go anywhere you want. Just don't stay here. After three days, you can come back and see what has happened to these people. Joseph left and returning three days later found a very quiet compound. He wondered where everyone was. Then he saw a boy hiding behind the wall of the king's palace. The boy was bleeding and when Joseph tried to talk to him put a finger to his lips. Come over here, he whispered. After Joseph drew near, the boy said, Your God is great. What? Joseph asked. I said, Your God is great, the boy said. How is it that you are the only person who left us three days ago? Many of us were shot and killed, but you are the only one who escaped. How? Joseph pressed the boy for details, and the boy led him to a mound of dirt. He said it was the mass grave of more than 40 people. The soldiers didn't train anyone, he said. They shot people and took survivors away in cages. Then Joseph noticed a snake lying motionless on the ground. The boy said it was the king who had lived in the palace and he had been slain. Let me show you the prince who has taken over from the king, he said. Joseph couldn't take his eyes off the snake. How did a snake rule the world and call itself king, he asked. I don't understand how people could accept a snake as king. I can't explain this to you right now, the boy replied. At that moment, Joseph woke up. He didn't understand the dream but he sensed God was calling him to leave the church of his father. Where should he go? Your 13th Sabbath offering on December 30 will help spread the gospel in the West Central Africa division, which includes Guinea. Thank you for planning a generous offering. We'll read more about Joseph's story next week. You have been listening to a reading of the Adult Sabbath School Lessons by Dr. Percy Harold and the inside story by his niece, Sibylla. Apart from being provided free to those who are visually impaired, these audio lessons are available on the official General Conference Sabbath School and Personal Ministry app, on SoundCloud, Apple iTunes, and also on YouTube. Search for Percy Harold Sabbath to find all of these. And remembering all the time that God is always faithful.